Welcome to the GCN Tech Show. This week we've got the news that Strava leaderboards are no longer free. Our new helmet sponsor, glasses you can see backwards with, the bike fold, your upgrades and our main talking point. How you can ride faster by just pacing yourself in the wind and on hills. Let's go. Thanks Manon. On to our main talking point now, which is how to pace a ride optimally with regards to wind and hills. And we're gonna do this by, well, using maths to tell us how we can ride as fast as possible. And the beauty of this is that, in theory, you should be able to ride faster without spending any money on fancy tech and skin suits and gadgets on your bike or getting any fitter. Just by deploying the fitness you've already got strategically, should be able to see some big gains. So let's have a look, starting with a paper that was published in 2013 by a chap called Anton, which looked at the optimum time trial pacing with respect to head and tail winds. To do this, he mathematically modeled, that's kind of like just a, a really boring version of, of the matrix, a time trial course that was out and back with a headwind section, well, a headwind in one direction and a tailwind in the other direction. And then he looked at different pacing strategies that cyclists might employ. So the first one would be riding at the same power throughout the entire uh, time trial. The next one would be trying to hold the same speed throughout the entire time trial. And then the third one would be to try and ride a bit harder into the headwind and a bit easier into the tailwind and try and work out what that optimum uh, level of hardness would be. So the, uh, the optimum pacing strategy, uh, but not trying to ride at the same speed in both the headwind and the tailwind. So which do you think is the best way to do it? I know in the past, I'd probably try and hold the same power throughout. According to the data uh, and the, and the modeling, riding at constant power uh, or riding at trying to average the same speed throughout the ride over a, an hour long effort yield roughly the same results. And according to Anton's modeling, would result in you being 2.6 minutes slower over an hour long effort relative to if you paced it optimally by slightly high, you know, increasing your power into the headwind and lowering your effort with the tailwind. But to show this further, I think it's time for a practical example. Oh, thank heavens, I'm starting to get a little bit bored. Fortunately, I don't have to go outside because this is given in the paper. Oh. So imagine a flat time trial. Flat helps us simplify the model. 12 miles out, 12 miles back. And we've also got a cross tailwind going on and a cross headwind in the other direction, eight and a half miles per hour. So we've got 24 miles in total. Now, Anton reckons that if you work out the maths versus the drag coefficients, the amount of effort required, the optimum speed with this wind condition would be to uh, ride 220 watts with the tailwind and 420 watts into the headwind. This would give you speeds of 27 and a half miles per hour with the wind and 21.3 miles an hour with the, uh, the headwind. Now bear with me. Now if you rode at a constant power in this scenario of 330 watts for the sake of argument, you would be over two minutes slower. And if you tried to average the same speed throughout the ride, that would just be really, really hard. You'd have to do 120 watts with the wind and then 540 watts into the wind, which is just kind of like much too big a swing. Although, to be fair, 220 watts versus 420 watts is also a pretty big swing. Perhaps there's a more sort of happy medium to be found within that. Now to this end, Anton has proposed a rule of thumb to help you set up ideal pacing for your rides. So he reckons you should choose a target speed, which you can pick based on experience of what you think you can do or what you want to try and do, um, which he labels as V0. And then you should estimate the angle resolved wind speed. So uh, that's relative to the direction you're traveling in, what the wind direction, what the wind speed is at that direction. You need to use a bit of, uh, bit of, bit of cosine action for that. Um, and then you should endeavor to ride at your target velocity plus the uh, angle resolved wind speed divided by four 
when you've got a tailwind and then you should aim to ride at your target velocity minus your um, angle resolved wind speed divided by two when the wind is a headwind and then vary your speed accordingly. Now this intrigued me, uh, but it also intrigued Professor Michael Slavinsky, who is a mathematical physicist and keen cyclist. And he decided to perform his own investigations to try and merge mathematical models like Anton's with real life practical data. Kind of like a quantum theory of cycling. Sorry, that's like a, a, a really nerdy joke, not, not even a very good one. This is cool and potentially really useful because it can help reinforce mathematical data and aid in better predicting performance. And he looked at a flat course, but also a hilly course as well, where the average gradient was 4.6%. Now, the first thing that stands out to me on this paper is that to increase your speed by 1% uh, requires an increase of power of about 2.3% when you're riding on the flat. Uh, but if you want to increase your speed by 1% while riding on a hill, it only requires an increase of power of about 1.1%. Now, that might not sound like much, it's, almost, well, it's more than double, but the, the the key thing that shows you is that it makes sense to push much harder on the hills in a race or a time trial than it does to push on the flats because you gain far more time back on the hills. And this is something that we've kind of seen in you know, famous time trials like the uh, World Championships that Bradley Wiggins won against Tony Martin. He went ballistic on the big climb at the end and made up loads of time. And you can see how that worked. Furthermore, re remaining with that linear approximation, uh, he calculates that on the flat course, an increase in speed by 1% requires a 22% mass reduction, which is massive and shows that weight doesn't make a huge amount of difference on the flats. But if you want 1% extra speed uh, on a hill, you only need to reduce your mass by about 1%. That's a tiny fraction, but it also enforces that you really do want to push more when you're riding on the hills and you're pacing an event. Also because aerodynamics matters much less when you're going uphill because you're traveling at slower speeds. That is really interesting, but there is one thing I would like to add is in the real world, this will have to be adapted to the individual. So for example, the amount they can sustain over the FTP in the wind or on incline without absolutely destroying themselves will vary from person to person. Some people might be able to sustain 10% of their FTP and some people might be really good anaerobically and be able to sustain 20%. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's a good point. I mean, but you can still draw some conclusions. Uh, your overall speed and, you know, well, wh wh how that affects your finishing position in an event will definitely benefit from expending extra energy at the more difficult points when you're riding. So, on a hill, go harder. In a headwind, go harder. Um, and it will also benefit from you saving energy and going easier when the terrain is easier. So when you've got a tailwind or when you're going downhill, but not too much because going too far um, in, in that direction of going too easy slows you down again and then gets you approaching that sort of equal speeds scenario. This quantifies an adage that riding with the wind does not compensate for the speed loss by riding against the wind. The loss is due to dissipation of energy due to rolling air and drivetrain resistance, which present both on upwind and downwind sections. The fastest conditions are likely to be on still days. Wow, so you were listening. Um, well, let us know how you get on with this. It's certainly I'm going to change the way I think I pace time trials in the future. I've done a lot of time trials, but generally I've sort of often just tried to average a power because I, I sort of know the kind of power I can do for like 20, 20 minutes or the power I can do for an hour. And I just try and do that. Or I try and do a sort of negative split where I go a little bit easier in the first half and then raise it a little bit in, in the second half. But yeah, this is definitely going to change the way I go about it in the future.
maybe I'll, maybe I'll do a bit better. Um, but it's also worth pointing out there are web tools that can help with pacing as well. Things like My Windsock and Best Bike Split can help devise pacing strategies um, depending on the wind. But we'll include links in the description to the uh, academic papers um, so you can check them out and, and read them at your leisure. There's some interesting stuff in them. First up in hot tech, we've got some big Strava news. So Strava's a platform that's very popular amongst us cyclists and it's changing its subscription model. So gone is the kind of bit more complicated hierarchy of subscriptions that it called Summit. And in its place is a more simple model. You either opt in or you opt out. And it's $5 a month, I think, if you pay annually and $8 if you pay on a month by month basis. Previously, the subscription gave you access to extra features, such as filtered leaderboards, so you could see how you stacked up against your friends, or live segments, so you could challenge yourself in real time on your head unit, and additional fitness analytics tools as well that went into a bit more detail than just the, the standard offering. However, now, following the change, to access features that were previously free, such as leaderboards uh, and routing and devising uh, mapping and routes, you will require a subscription. Now, according to Strava, uh, this is required because in order to get their business off the ground, they needed lots of active users on the website and in the app. And they felt that by initially charging for the service, they wouldn't have achieved the number of active users they've got. But now they've got that critical mass of active users in order to now make the company profitable. According to Strava, they now need to start charging for that service because it costs them money to create it and run it in order to make their company profitable. But what do you think uh, about this? You know, we're keen to hear your opinion, so fire them down you know, in the comment section below. Are you happy to pay for segment leaderboards or do you think they should remain free? Um, we'll also put a poll in the app that you can click on and you can vote and have your say in there. Really keen to, to get your opinions on this. Earlier this week, Physique announced a new shoe. The Tempo Overcurve R4 Les Classique, designed with the cobbles in mind. These shoes have details inspired by the grit, the mud, and the cobblestones of the cobbled classics. They feature Physique's moderately stiff R4 outsole, asymmetrical overcurve design, and a micro-adjustable bower dial. And I do have to say, they look pretty cool. Now as cyclists, we are always conscious about traffic coming from behind us and always checking over our shoulder to see if it's clear. Well, not for much longer. Former Olympic champion Callum Skinner and physicist Alex McDonald have launched a Kickstarter campaign for Hindsight Rear View Cycling Glasses with the aim to boost safety for all road cyclists. They look like any other ordinary glasses, but they have rear view lens technology, meaning that cyclists can maintain their forward vision whilst achieving rear vision with only a minimal glance of the head. It'll be interesting to see if these do work and if they catch on. Finally, in hot tech this week, we've got new helmets. Uh, we are now gonna be partnering with Giro. Check this out, we've got the new Aether model. Nice, also conveniently comes in this red fade, which uh, goes well, well, perfectly with the new GCN kit. Wunderbar. Um, and it's also brilliant at hiding my lockdown hair as well, bonus. Uh, so yeah, going forwards, if you see us wearing Giro helmets in videos and you're wondering why, now you know. More hot tech next week. It's now time for screw round upgrades, buy upgrades, where you submit upgrades that you've made to your cycling lives or bikes for a chance to win the ultimate prize, a GCN cap. Now, before we move on to this week, let's take a look at last week's results. And if you can remember, they were two very good upgrades that I chose. We had Whacking Willie's Homemade Kicker versus Mouse's Cafe Racer. And it was a close one. With 55% of the votes, it was Mouse's Cafe Racer. So well done. Send us your details on Facebook and we'll send you out a cap. First upgrade this week is in from Matthias. He bought an old CX bike in October to try it out for the winter. Um, he had lots of fun on it, riding it in the mud and gravel, and then he gave it some upgrades. 
He replaced the worn out wheels for some old full chromes he had, gave it a new DIY paint job. Now I'm a very big pan, pan? fan of the paint job on this. I think it is a very good paint job. Um, put some second hand Ultegra rear derailleur and shifters, replaced the chain and cassette, bottom bracket and all new cables. Uh, compact bars and stem, Victoria tires, and to top it off, salvage some awesome bar tape that you had from small bars. Very impressive. Matthias is up against David, and he bought an old single speed orange hardtail from eBay for £77. He added a few upgrades, including disc brakes and new forks, as we can see in the picture, and he had inspiration and added road wheels to a mountain bike frame as well as 11 speed mech and calipers. And he says it rides absolutely fantastic. I do quite like the yellow pedals from the very first picture that I'm guessing is when he first had it from eBay. Um, and yeah, here's the finished product. Disc brakes, very good upgrade. Cannondale fork. And I quite like that the frame is green, but it says orange. <laughs> Um, anyway, I think that's another really good upgrade. But it's not down to me, it's down to you guys. Who do you think has the best upgrade? Head over to the GCN app and get voting. Who wins the cap? It's now time for the bike vault where you submit pictures of your bikes, your pride and joy, and I vote if they're nice or super nice. And if they're super nice, you guessed it. The bike vault bell gets rung and they get put to the bike vault forever and ever and ever. Although if you do disagree with my judgments on the bikes in the bike vault today, you can have your very own say on the bikes if you head over to the GCN app in the bike vault and you can vote on so many bikes, even us presenters have put our bikes in there. So head over there and get voting. The first bike in the bike vault this week is this one in from Daniel. And he has submitted his Specialized S Work Tarmac SL6 with Ultegra Di2. And wow, this is a very bling bike. I don't even know where to start. Obviously, I'm going to start with the paint job. That is a beautiful paint job. I do really like that. Haven't seen anything like that before. We've even got some really nice details on here too. I like the zip stem as well, aero stem, and a bit of a pink chain. Big fan of pink, are you, Daniel? Um, we're in Biggie Smalls, the crank's at three o'clock. Okay, the only thing I can see is the valves aren't lined up, but they're like, they're kind of symmetrical. So, I think this, in my opinion, this is a super nice, I am a big fan. Next up this week is this one in from Ollie, and this is a Canyon. Ultimate CFSL with Shimano 105 and DT Swiss wheels. Now, nice bike, not no chimney, but we're not in Biggie Smalls and the cranks aren't lined up and it's not really the right angle to give the bike the full potential. So this needs to be resubmitted. You want to be like, like Daniel's was. Daniel's was a good example of just dead on straight. We want to see everything, the drive chain, everything. So it's a, it is a nice bike. That has, it has potential, I've said it before, but it's just about the little details, I think, especially the cranks and in Biggie Smalls, quite a big one, so, and the valves. But it does, it does change on a bike to bike basis, so. Yeah, so this is just a nice from me. Next one in from Nelson. Sent in this custom painted to Fossi from 2019 with Campagnolo EPS. And wow, that is some view. Now I'm not, not saying the picture is all about the view, but I'm not sure where that is, but I don't think it says. Maybe put where you take the photo as well, because that is so cool definitely not Wales but um custom painted this is pretty cool we've got a gold frame and silver silver forks black handlebar tape black saddle I think this is a super nice very nice let me know where you took the picture 
Next up, we have this one in from Jepetalbo. I think that's how you say it. And this is a Factor One with Shimano Ultegra Di2 disc with black ink wheels. We've got our first gold chain of the bike vault this week. Fist pump. Gold and silver theme going on this week. This is very nice. We're in Biggie Small. Cranks are at three o'clock. Nice cockpit, no chimney. Big fan. I'm gonna give this a super nice. Moving on, this one in from Dwayne, and this is a specialized S-Work tarmac um, with Ultegra. Oh, okay, we're in the big ring, but we're not in the smalls at the back. This is Biggie Big? Biggie Big. We don't like Biggie Big, we like Biggie Smalls. The crank isn't at three o'clock. It's a good angle, there is a good angle on the bike. I can see the bike nicely. Oh, we've nearly lined the valves up. That's a close one, that's a first for the bike fault this week. But I think, I think it could do a lot better, so it's just a nice from me. Still a nice. So that is it for the bike fault this week. Remember, if you did disagree with any of my judgments on these bikes, you can have your own say by heading over to the GCN app and voting nice or super nice on all of these bikes. And remember, if you want your bike in the Bike Vault, you can also submit your bike in the GCN app for a chance for it to be on the show next week. That's all for this week. I hope you've enjoyed the show. And if you have and you'd like to support what we do, then uh, you know, give us a thumbs up and a subscribe if you haven't already. Oh, that Java warning's back again. For God, I thought I'd got rid of it last time. Chief, I tell you what though, at least, at least the plants come back to life. Yeah, have some good news, some good news this week. Anyway, don't forget to head over to the GCN shop, got all sorts of merch there, mugs and hoodies and all that, and yeah, all good stuff. Greatest t-shirts available to humanity. And uh, yeah, I'll see you next week. Just marvelling my, my plant resuscitation skills. It's definitely the same plant, it's not a new one. It's, not, it's definitely not been replaced. I'd, it's, it is exactly the same one. I just, it's been, it's definitely, I just, like,